Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. I want the job, I said. It was two years ago, but I can vividly recall every aspect of that interview. The innocence of those four words. The stillness of the gallery. My befuddled reaction to Amy Andrews the gallery owner whose questions unsettled me. Her composure never waned. Are you a spiritual man, Mr. Hull? Miss Andrews asked. Yes, I answered. Are we talking about the art? I can't say I'd be able to give philosophical or religious insights. Don't worry, Miss Andrews replied, smiling. I'm not trying to trip you up. In a way, my question does relate to the paintings, but perhaps not in the way you might expect. I was a police officer for many years before working as a security guard at the embassy, I said. I have plenty of references. The gallery owner raised a hand, smiling politely. I've seen your CV. I promise that you don't have to fight your corner, Mr. Hull. I know you're physically capable, but this job takes a toll on a mental level. I nodded my head, ignorantly believing that I understood her. I know. I worked many solo night shifts at the embassy but I can handle it. That's not what I mean, she replied. Do you know why my gallery exhibits a permanent display of my sister's artwork? To honor her memory, I said. I saw that news clip a couple of years ago about her admittance to the local psychiatric ward. Harper Andrews, right? I'm sorry, that must have been tough on your family. Not as tough as Harper found it, Miss Andrews replied. Her artwork tells the story of her decline into sickness. Not sickness of the mind, but sickness of the soul. She faced something and captured it in these paintings to protect humanity. Hearing her speak, I thought Amy seemed just as unwell as her sister, but I would soon learn that it was no delusion. Every night on the job is terrifying, but none so much as the first, and I'll never forget Miss Andrews' parting words as she walked out of the door. At night, the paintings must be closely guarded. Left unobserved for too long, they can... well... Just make sure you keep watch. What is this? Night at the museum? I mused, trying not to chuckle. No. Far worse than fiction. The first hour of my shift was blissfully mundane. Basking in the blue glow of the gallery's security lighting, a perturbing painting eyeballed me from the far wall. It depicted a lanky, pencil-thin man with frightfully long legs and a pair of white eyes which seemed to follow me around the room, as all freakish eyes in paintings do. As I strolled around the gallery, following Miss Andrews's strict rule of regularly observing the paintings, I took a closer look at the white-eyed man. I shivered at his janky jaw, which hung abnormally loosely. He wore jet-black trousers, but his monstrous bony torso was shirtless, and he was the farthest a man could be from looking human. I stopped to read the plaque beneath the painting of the haunting figure. The Exactor The one who exacts torture, he longs to break free, he will devour mankind. I hurried past the painting, reasonably certain that nobody would ever dream of stealing artwork so horrifying. No need to guard it too closely. But the gallery didn't exactly become more joyous as I continued my round. They were petrifying. I should have given the paintings more than a cursory glance before applying for the job position. Another painting portrayed a young girl, no more than ten years of age, who wore a bright red pinafore, plaited brunette hair, and a blank face. Not figuratively. Blank. In place of eyes, a nose, and a mouth, there was only skin. Taut flesh, painted with smooth brushstrokes that made Harper's intentions abundantly clear. The artist had not accidentally smudged the face she had purposefully neglected to give the little girl any features. Harper's Youth Dies As we age, we slowly come to life. We sin. They know that. They know everything. There were countless paintings of dreadful scenes, too. Cities in ruin. The end of the world. Endless infernos of melting flesh and they were the lucky ones who were offered a swift mercy. The survivors in the apocalyptic paintings were tortured in gory, gruesome ways, 
by dreadful, inhuman men like the one in the first painting. I usually have a strong stomach, but something about those paintings filled me with unbearable dread. The apocalyptic art seemed so visceral. As I viewed it, I was certain I heard the screams of the last humans on Earth, felt the heat of the flames on my skin, saw the exactors move. And then there was a painting of the art gallery. The plaque read, Prison. They entered our world, so I locked them here. Feeling suitably terrified, I scurried to the sofa by the gallery's entrance and plopped myself down. I work a day job, and the night shift is just my way of making ends meet. The exhaustion of that jam-packed day finally hit me. It was only when I sat down on the sofa that fatigue walloped me like a wall. My eyelids closed. An hour later, a thrumming sound startled me awake. I twisted my head to see a notification on my phone, chuckling in relief. I opened the message from Kara, my wife, welcoming the distraction from my isolated, soundless night shift. But it was an odd message. I was telling my mum about your new job and she said you should look for another one. Apparently there are always adverts for the night shift on Facebook and her friend's husband had a mental breakdown after one shift. He won't talk to anyone about what happened. There was another thrumming sound, but it wasn't a vibration from my phone, it was a muffled voice. My head snapped up in time to catch a silhouette vanishing behind one of the gallery walls. I managed to stifle a scream, but I lost my composure and clammed up. I contemplated running out of the gallery, but something stopped me, and it wasn't the prospect of being fired. It was those paintings of Armageddon. I rose to my feet, using the flashlight on my phone to illuminate the dimly lit gallery floor. That muffled sound repeated again, haunting me a ghostly groan of some emotion I couldn't quite place, but I knew it terrified me, and when I rounded the corner I found myself facing something utterly inexplicable. The girl from Harper's youth dies, a young version of Harper I could only assume. I trembled on the spot as she took clunky steps towards me with frail, near-skeletal legs. She continued to groan, seemingly speaking beneath the flesh that covered her entire face. I can't understand you. I whispered in horror as the ghastly girl stopped a foot in front of me. I found myself leaning forward, driven by a force beyond my control, and then the most horrifying thing happened. My cheek twisted to the side, allowing my ear to melt through the phantom pool of the girl's face. I screamed silently, terrified to find that I was unable to move my body or utter a sound. Then, with my ear beneath the flesh on Harper's horrendous, featureless face, I could finally hear the words she had been repeating in a muffled, ghoulish voice. Why did you close your eyes? The malformed ghost asked in a distorted cry. My body was suddenly hurled to the floor and the little girl fled into the shadows. My eyes shot to the far wall and I found that my gut achieved the impossible. It sank to a deeper realm of fear. He was gone. The exactor was a blank canvas. The horrible entity had escaped its painting. Harper's disembodied voice whispered beside my ear, scaring the life out of me. Find him. He's hiding. I looked up at the ghostly girl's painting. Harper had returned to the canvas, but she was adopting a different pose. Her index finger was pointing at the painting of the art gallery. I yelped in fright, seeing what she had noticed. Behind one of the painted windows on the empty top floor of the building, that inhuman man stood and watched me. Legs shaking, I walked across the gallery to the set of stairs in the back corner. They led to an out-of-bounds floor. Miss Andrews made that abundantly clear. But she also made it clear that I had to keep my eyes on the artwork, and I failed at that. I didn't really have any options. Quivering, I crept up the creaky wooden stairs to a floor that was littered with unhung paintings. The frames were shrouded in white sheets and at the far end of the room, illuminated only by the moonlight which poured through the murky glass panes, I saw something truly terrifying. The exactor. He stood as tall as the ceiling and his large form was crouching over an uncovered painting. As I crept closer, I saw what had captivated the terrible creature. It was one of Harper's apocalyptic paintings, depicting a world in flames, and the exactor was melding its shriveled, unclothed arm with the canvas much as young Harper sank my ear through her flesh. 
However, as I approached the abomination, casting my flashlight upon him, its flesh started to sizzle, and it unleashed a hideous hissing sound. At first I thought the light hurt it, but then I realized it had become aware of the guard's watchful eyes upon it. I finally realized the power of keeping watch. I knew why I was there. Cast it away, Harper's voice whispered. How? I cried. The man spun around and I screamed at the sight of his wretched white eyes. They were worse in the flesh, and he was far larger than he had appeared in the painting. The entity lunged at me, coiling its bony hands around my neck, squeezing the light out of my soul. I slipped into the darkness, and the exactor howled at me, a howl that sounded like a boat's horn. Tell it to return to its cell, Harper croaked. Tell it that you won't stop looking at it until it does what you say. I wheezed, watching flickering images in the exactor's blank eyes. Prophecies of a direful destruction, a fiery vision of mankind's end at the hands of this terrifying apparition and its demonic army. He intended to scare me, but the thought of such a horrific future only motivated me to keep my eyes open. I won't stop, I said, slowly choking, until you stop. Inhuman flesh burning beneath the weight of my vision, the exactor screeched in fury, but I thought the world might already be doomed. If I'd passed out, I would have left the demon unguarded and free to wreak havoc up in Mankin. But in some favorable twist of fate it released my neck and I fell to the ground. It, too, must have been close to Diet. I crawled downstairs and the canvases were filled with paint once more. Everything was back in its place, and the strangest thing is that I didn't hang up my hat. I didn't call it a day. When Miss Andrews came to the gallery at six in the morning, she seemed fully prepared to watch another traumatized guard quit the job. But I didn't. I couldn't. Not after seeing the exactor's apocalyptic desire. Too much is at stake. I'm a security guard who works the night shift at an art gallery, and my wife bought one of the haunted paintings. For those of you who missed the first post, my night shifts as an art gallery's security guard are more horrifying than anything a person should endure. My job isn't to protect the paintings, it's to protect humanity from the paintings. Each canvas is a paranormal cell. The artist, Harper Andrews, even contained a terrifying interpretation of her younger self in a portrait as a safeguard. That faceless child isn't even the worst thing in there. There are paintings of mankind's doom, hellfire, Armageddon. And then there's the painting of the exactor, an inhuman man, tall as a tree, with woefully white eyes and a limp jaw. He and his malformed minions are imprisoned in the gallery's exhibits, and they seek freedom. They long to eternally torture mankind in unimaginable ways. They plot a fate worse than death. I've spoken about my first shift, but I'm sure you didn't think I'd gone two years without another incident. One particular evening, about four months ago, a text conversation with my wife took a horrifying turn. Kara. You can quit the day job, surely. You're making plenty of money from the gallery. Me. You just want to spend more time with me. You louve me. Kara. Well, it is a little suspicious that you spend so much time away from home. Have you got another woman on the side? Eh? Amy's hot in a squint your eyes kind of way. Me. There's a higher chance of me hooking up with one of Harper's demons. Kara. Ooh. That reminds me. I just bought one of the paintings. Couldn't resist. Fuck. I should have told my wife about my work. I should have told her about the terrible nature of the things I guard. She never would have bought the artwork if she'd known it were more than paint on a canvas. After reading her message, I hurriedly rang her. Please tell me you were joking, I said, shaking. Are you okay, Frank? You sound weird, Kara replied. Why did you have to buy one of the paintings, I asked. What? You know I like macabre things, she chortled. Don't be a baby. You stare at those paintings all night. What's so wrong with having one of them in our living room? I don't even, I don't understand why Amy would sell her sister's work, I said. I pulled her aside for a chat after you showed me around the gallery. Honestly, I can't believe it took you over a year to give me a tour. Such beautiful paintings, disturbing, but beautiful. Harper Andrews is incredibly talented. What happened to her is sad, Kara sighed. You just made an offer that Amy accepted, I asked. She claimed to have little attachment to it. She said it isn't one of the paintings that demands eyes upon it. 
seemed a rude comment because I think it's as great as the rest of her sister's art, but... Kara began. I have to go, I interrupted, hanging up the phone. It was an hour or so before my night shift, but I arrived early. Amy Andrews was engrossed in conversation with the last few gallery visitors of the day, but I quickly dragged her away from the crowd. Fury frotted to the surface of my lips. Why did you sell one of the paintings to Kara? I asked. Miss Andrews answered in an eerily flat tone. I come from a wealthy family, Mr. Hull, but I'm not that wealthy. I have limited income streams, and I have to keep the gallery's lights on. Sure, I make money from memberships and fundraising events, but I try to sell paintings too. But Harper... You know they need to be watched at all times, I protested. Not all of them, she said. And that was when I realized which painting was missing from the gallery. There was an empty spot on the wall above the plaque that read, Harper's Youth Dees. What have you done? I gasped. My sister's demented self-portrait might be horrifying, Mr. Hull, but it doesn't intend to harm us. It's not one that needs to be watched. And your wife paid handsomely for it, Miss Andrews explained, shrugging. I gripped my employer's arm in a moment of madness that could have cost my job, and, for all I knew, the future of mankind. On that first night, young Harper was the entity that kept watch over me, I hissed furiously. Your sister painted herself for a reason. Everything in this gallery has a purpose. Don't you understand that? For a flicker of a moment, I was certain that something flashed in Amy Andrews' eyes. Something black. And the corner of her lips twitched, as if to reveal that she were well aware of what she had done. But her mouth quickly returned to its normal position. I pay you to watch over the exhibits, she said. You shouldn't need anyone or anything to watch over you. Fuck this. I spat. I'm going home and I'm bringing that painting back with me. Miss Andrews huffed, glancing at her watch. Fifty-five minutes until your shift begins. I'd hurry. I drove home, mind racing with the horror of Miss Andrews' crooked grin. Did she intentionally sell the painting to sabotage the gallery? I wondered. Don't be foolish. If she were that evil, she could have just left the paintings unwatched, freeing the exactor into the world. I tried to still my throbbing heartbeat as I pulled onto our street. After hurriedly parking, I didn't even close the car door behind me. I raced into our darkened home and started screaming at the top of my lungs, Kara, where are you? In the living room, she shouted. Why are we yelling? I rushed into the room and my chest loosened a little. There was no sign of destruction, just my wife sitting on the sofa in a well-lit room. Harper's Youth Dyes hung on the wall, but the girl's ghastly form remained in its canvas. Thank fuck, I exhaled. What is your deal with this creepy little girl, Kara asked, laughing. I just... I have to take it back, Kara. I'll make sure Miss Andrews gives us a refund. My wife rose to her feet and walked over to the painting, stroking Harper's featureless face. I shuddered in terror, waiting for the ghoul to leap free from its frame. I assumed that she wouldn't hurt us. But I wasn't certain of anything. Come and give her a stroke, my wife teased. She doesn't bite. I looked at my phone. I had half an hour until the start of my shift. Miss Andrews hadn't made it clear what would happen if I weren't on time. I feared she might do something worse than fire me. She might leave the paintings unattended. I'll get you a better painting, I said. Something creepy from another gallery. Just anything other than a Harper Andrews piece. Please. Would it make you happier if I were to draw a smiley face on her? Kara asked. My wife dipped her finger into her glass of water, and I cried in agony as she drew a crude pair of dots and a pencil-thin smile on Harper's featureless face. Kara frowned at my gawping mouth when she finished. Relax, we own it, she said. Besides, it'll dry, don't worry. I walked over to her and seized her hands tightly, taking a deep breath. Kara... I said gently, I'm begging you. She frowned. Shit. I know that look, Frank. You're genuinely scared. Why? Just tell me, and I'll let you take the painting back. You saw a ghost when you were young, didn't you? I asked. Kara nodded. 
My, my dad, shortly after the car crash. Hard to believe, but I did. Well, I know you believe. You said you once saw your grandma's ghost, didn't you? I gripped her hands tightly and nodded. Right, so we believe in spirituality. Well, this painting... All of Harper's paintings are gateways to... to something unearthly. And that's why I guard them. I'm sorry it took me so long to tell you. My wife hung her head and shook it. You talk in your sleep, you know. You've been having nightmares for months. Talking about an entity and the end of the world. I knew there was something wrong with you. I... The light suddenly cut out and a wisp of wind like a hissing voice filled the room. Kara shrieked and leapt into my arms. I shuddered, keeping her close to my chest so she couldn't see what I saw. Harper's youth dies. The watery marks on Harper's featureless face glowed faintly in the darkness, a dim, white light. And the most terrifying part was that the droplets which formed the smile had inexplicably transformed into a sulk. May I take it? I asked Kara in a whisper. She nodded, face burrowed deeply into my chest, so I guided her to the bedroom and instructed her to shut the door. I checked my phone, 20 minutes until my shift. I seized the painting from the wall, sprinted out of the house, and lunged into my car. When I arrived at the art gallery, the lights were off and Amy's car was nowhere in sight. Fortunately, I was on time for my shift, but I had no way of knowing how long she left the place unattended. I hurried inside and immediately hung Harper's youth dies above its plaque. The gallery was full again. I looked at the painting of the exactor. I was relieved to see the monstrosity was still encaged. But something still felt wrong. There was a churning chasm in my gut. You're not in the art gallery. Harper's entity whispered in a distorted voice. I finally saw what she meant. The colors of my surroundings started to swirl. The gallery walls, the floor, the paintings, and even my hands looked murky. The world was composed of paint. I was composed of paint. And when I looked into the street, I saw the towering edges of a painting's frame. I was trapped in prison. Harper's depiction of the art gallery, which you may remember from my first post. And I knew I was trapped in the painting because I could see the real world beyond the canvas. My memories flooded back. When I'd entered the real art gallery, the exactor tricked me. He stood in his painting and everything seemed fine. I looked into those horrible white eyes and that's when its mouth tore open to swallow me. I screeched into the hellish nothingness. Never had I felt such nightmarish horror before, not even on my first night in the gallery. I felt dead, worse than dead. I thought I'd entered hell itself. I thought I'd failed at my job and the rapture had commenced. I thought of so many sickening possibilities as the exactor's blackened void engulfed me. Squirming inside his darkened body, I was carried by the inhuman man across the gallery floor, and he aggressively spat me into the canvas of prison. I'd forgotten that. He made me forget that I'd left the real world. It's looking for an exit, Harper's voice croaked. Me too, I cried. I looked at Harper's painting, and she wasn't there. In her place, there was a doorway with a flickering green exit sign above it. I felt the brush strokes of that painted world stretch and strain. The canvas was crushing me. I didn't belong there. My painted form tightened, and I rushed to the doorway that Harper had created, terrified of what might happen if I were to stay in that false world for a moment longer. As my hand met the painted canvas within the painted canvas, my body liquefied and merged with the exit on the canvas. A blackness, still and serene, enveloped me. And then I found myself lying on a tiled floor. A real tiled floor, choking. Back in reality, I gazed across the gallery and my eyes met a terrible sight. The contents of every painting had spilled onto the floor. The exactor stood proudly amidst his minions, plotting in a sharp whisper. I'd expected a cacophonous roar of noise from the apocalyptic demons, but something about the near silence of their scheming was even more frightening. Still in the distance I could hear human screams again, the apocalyptic sound of mankind being tortured in an endless oblivion. The agonizing cries were almost tuneful in a terribly dissonant way. Choral screaming, humanity's horrifying final song. Suddenly, 
in unearthly unison, the Exactor's minions, smaller versions of him, but no less terrifying, snapped their heads backwards to face me, as if the brittle bones in their necks had jellied. I screamed at their upside-down faces, which hung over their unclothed backs. They were white-eyed and slack-jawed, eyeing me from the middle of the room. They wheezed as their skin sizzled beneath the weight of my eyes upon them. Back to your paintings, I feebly shrieked. There was nothing commanding about my tone. Pure terror drove me, and the exactor could see that. His eyes pierced mine, as they had on that first night. In them, I saw nothing. The absence of anything. And by that, I mean the end of everything, the end of man, the end of ends. He tried to fill me with dread beyond imagination, and he succeeded, but it was the same fateful error that he made on that first night. I thought of Kara, my parents, my friends, everyone I love. That was what motivated me whilst my eyes watered under the strain of looking at those horrid things. Ghoulish voices chittered that I must either close my eyelids or die. I didn't fall for the entity's egregious schemes. I clenched my fists, armed only with my eyes and sheer willpower. The minions retreated first, flesh burning, they scurried backwards, dragging their upside-down heads and misshapen limbs with them back into the flames of their painted paradise. And it'll always be a dream, I told myself. But the exactor remained, mouth gaping so wide that it dropped past his shoulders. His flesh scorched. Wisps of smoke billowed from his shirtless torso and raggedy trousers. In one final fit of rage, he took powerful strides towards me and outstretched one of his slender arms. I caught his wrist before those gnarled, ghastly fingers could wrap around my neck, and the pain was unexplainable. It was a deep burning of the mind, not the body. The exactor's last-ditch attempt to incapacitate the guard who was standing between it and the apocalypse. I saw Kara, she was sitting in our living room, smiling at something on the wall. I could only watch in unbridled horror as her flesh melted before my very eyes. Horrifyingly, she continued to smile, even when she'd been reduced to smoldering bloody meat on the sofa. The exactor showed me what she saw. On the wall there hung a painting of our house burning to the ground in the midst of mankind's total annihilation. On the streets, the exactor's minions inflicted unspeakable horrors upon humanity. A demon gutted a woman with a protruding bone from her own severed limb. That's the only scene I can put into writing. The rest are too dreadful. Wait. It's not real. It's another trick. Kara wouldn't smile at such horror. My eyes ached under the immense strain of watching that unholy apparition. But the exactor caved first. Unable to bear my eyes upon it, it wriggled free from my grip, taking what appeared to be excruciating steps back to its canvas. And when it returned to its frame, the choral screaming ceased. The gallery was still and silent. I spent the rest of my shift standing in that exact spot, eyeballing the paintings before me. I didn't speak, and I didn't move. Before I left the building at the end of my shift, I quickly glanced back at prison, the painting that trapped me. Existential dread gripped my heart, and four months later, it still hasn't released me. I can't stop thinking about how it felt to be within that canvas. How will I ever know that I'm in the real world? What if the apocalypse has already happened? I might be living in a painting right now. Well, there you go. Another direful tale from the art gallery. Another near miss. Just part and parcel of the job, eh? Since my first shift, nothing has been the same. Every passing day feels worse than the last. The impending apocalypse casts a long shadow over my life. I explained everything to Kara, and she knows why I can't quit. And now you know that I worry about something other than the exactor. Amy Andrews, something's wrong with her. Perhaps I should speak to the one person who could actually give me some answers. I think I need to visit the local psychiatric ward. I'm a security guard who works the night shift at an art gallery, and the world might end tomorrow. Harper Andrews, the woman who could provide answers to all of my questions. Yesterday afternoon, I visited her at the local psychiatric ward. I know why you're here, Harper said. The woman was slender and she wore pristine white attire. Her brunette hair was glistening in the midday sun. 
It hung in prim and proper plaits, which made me shudder. She was the spitting image of her painting. Harper's youth dies. That was unnerving, given that she was a couple of decades older than the version of herself that she'd painted. The paintings, I eventually replied. Harper smiled, motioning at the seat opposite her in the deserted canteen. I nodded awkwardly and slumped into the stiff plastic chair on the other side of the table. A member of staff loitered in the canteen doorway, keeping a watchful eye over us. Two years on the job, right? Harper asked. I think you would have summoned the courage to visit me a long time ago if this were only about the exactor. I shivered at the very mention of the name and I quickly glanced at the member of staff, just to ensure that he only stood six feet tall. For a fleeting moment I thought the nightmarish man from the painting had been hunching in the doorway and watching me. I'm not blaming you, Harper continued. I just want to save time. My sister isn't evil. In fact, she's a kind-hearted woman, and maybe part of her is still in there, but it's not the part that's in control. She longs to free the exactor and the others. I paused for a long time, staring into the dejected eyes of the woman before me. She looked sharp, focused. Well, not at all what I had expected. Why, why haven't you... If Amy... I trailed off. Harper sighed, reading my mind. Yes, I suppose killing her would have brought an end to things, wouldn't it? Yet somewhere deep down, she's still my sister. I'm sorry. And why, you might wonder. Hasn't she already freed the creatures from their painted prisons? That final question is the one that really needs to be answered, I think, I said. Harper nodded. Do you have your phone with you? Yeah. I replied. Why? Record my story, she said. I need you to document the knowledge that I'm about to pass on to you. Nobody has ever believed me, but you will. You've seen what's at stake. This is the transcript. The year was 2003. I was eight years old and Amy was in her 20s. My birth certainly caused an upheaval. Mum was a full-time lawyer and Dad was a historian. They thought their days of parenting were long behind them. Mum. Did I ruin Dad's life? I once asked. You were the best curveball that life threw at us, darling, my mom promised, and we chuckled. Dad loved us, but he spent so much time abroad. He wasn't quite so busy or successful in his youth, so I think he worried that he had been a better father to Amy. One fateful day, he sought to rectify that. Machu Picchu, he said. Let's go, you and me. What's in Pikachu, I asked. My dad laughed. Machu Picchu, it's a lost city. I think you'll love it. You could paint it. Your talents are wasted on the dull scenery around here. I didn't think I'd enjoy ancient ruins, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to spend time with dad, and he seemed so excited about the place. It was stunning. My eight-year-old brain wasn't immature enough to overlook that. And after hours of watching my father excavate what he called a point of interest, the man finally started to dance jubilantly. I stopped painting to see what had enthralled him. The fruit of his labor was a large slab of stone, and it was covered with dreadful etchings of ghastly creatures. My dad started jabbering ecstatically about the magnitude of what he'd uncovered. He spent a decade connecting dots between the mysterious vanishings of advanced cultures. There were indicators of a destructive force, a plague greater than anything earthly. He said there were entities which sought to destroy humanity, though their origin remained a mystery. They certainly weren't bound by physical laws, and my father uncovered detailed writings on rituals which successfully contained the abominations. He said salvation always came from imprisoning the entities, but they couldn't be killed, and they would always seek freedom. That was what terrified me. It, they would always seek freedom. And my father held their prison in his very hands, he had unearthed something which should have been left alone. When we returned to England, I slipped into my father's study and found his translated texts. I had a terrible feeling about the stone slab that he'd brought home. So, I studied the ritual that could imprison the entities. It involved detailed drawings and a watcher. But who was watching the drawings whilst they were buried beneath the earth in Machu Picchu? Nobody. 
my father's research seemed to suggest that the Inca artist in Machu Picchu had uncovered a new ritual. Something which allowed the Incas to trap the demons more successfully than their predecessors. If my father had only let it be, you would still be living a normal life, Frank Hull. None of us would be in this mess. Things quickly took a dark turn. My parents started bickering about that stone slab. Dad would obsessively stare at it until the early hours of the morning. He said it spoke to him. When my mother couldn't take it anymore, she left. Amy and I were distraught, and we hated our father. That was when my sister did something stupid. She destroyed the stone slab with a sledgehammer. Everything quickly fell apart. The exactor and his deformed creatures steadily rose from the shattered stone, and I fled the room. It was the moment I had dreaded, the prophecy which had riddled me with nightmares. I locked myself in my room and unboxed the paintings that I completed, in preparation, weeks ago. To imprison the freed demons in a new picture, however, a ritual was required. As many artists had done before me, I dislodged one of my teeth. Bloody gummed and teary from the agony, I started to shakily etch my name into each of the paintings with my baby tooth. And the most horrifying thing happened. One by one, black masses started to slither under my door. The creatures were unwillingly latching onto their painted forms. They were being trapped in a fresh prison. The house fell unnaturally still. I crept out of my bedroom and called for my family. When I entered the living room, I shuddered. The demons were gone, but my dad was sitting in his rocking chair. His eyes were vacant, and he was smiling. It was a wicked grin. Something beyond your darkest imagination. Blood oozed through finger tears in the fabric of his shirt. He had been clawing at his own flesh. He was still alive, but he didn't move a muscle or utter a word. He just grinned. Amy, meanwhile, was curled on the sofa in a fetal position. She was bawling her eyes out, and when the police arrived, they discovered something disturbing. Mum never left. Her body was found in the garden shed. She'd been decomposing for weeks. I was never saw the scene, but I vividly remember one of the paramedics throwing up on the grass. Our father went to prison, and Amy became my guardian. I explained everything to her, but she didn't believe me. So I kept a daily watch over the paintings, and years later, I used my inheritance money to open the art gallery. I thought it would lessen the burden if other eyes were on the paintings. Amy helped to run the place. She had her hands in lots of different money pots, so she didn't mind that the gallery was a bit of a money burner. However, one day she changed. She came home from the gallery with a vacant look in her eyes, a look that reminded me of Dad. She told me that she finally believed my story. She saw the exactor step out of its painting. I couldn't always be at the gallery, but Amy promised she would never leave the paintings unattended. She admitted that she had gone out to grab some food before locking up for the evening. If she hadn't returned in time, I... I suppose you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The world would already have ended. Anyway, my sister changed over the following years. She grew cold and distant. I started to see a darkness in her eyes and she spoke in a voice that wasn't hers. I became so fearful of her and her malevolent smile that I had a nervous breakdown. And that was her ticket. Well, the exactor's ticket. She had me committed to this ward four years ago. I suppose the exactor thought that without me in the way, he could puppeteer Amy to free him from the painting. All she had to do was make sure nobody looked at him. But why haven't things already fallen apart? Why did she hire guards to keep watch? Well, she still plays by my rules because I have something that the exactor needs. If it had so wished, that terrifying creature would have driven my sister to kill me, much as it drove my father to kill my mother. But it needs the tooth that I used in the ritual. The exactor always uses slaves to achieve that goal. It seeps into people's minds. At its behest, I'm certain my dad must have destroyed whatever Incan tool was used to etch the drawings on the stone slab. So even if Amy were to close her eyes or, better yet, destroy the paintings, it still wouldn't be enough to free the entities. Sounds like watching them might be unnecessary then, eh? 
As long as I keep the tooth hidden, you can just quit your security role and call it a day. No way the exactor can fulfill its destiny. Right? The problem is that an unwatched exactor, whilst unable to end the world, becomes freer and freer with every passing moment. Free enough to find me without Amy's help, perhaps, and infiltrate my mind to find the tooth's location. As long as somebody keeps watch, they remain in their paintings. Their real power lies in servants. My dad. And now, Amy. She visits me often and she only wants one thing from me, the tooth. But I still hold the power. She does what I say. Otherwise, I've threatened to end things. The secret dies with me. The exactor uses her to wear me down, but I'm stronger than it thinks. And that's everything, Frank Hull. The rest is a mystery even to me. I stopped recording at that point, and I exhaled deeply. There was so much information to digest. Have you seen the length of that transcript? Sorry to anyone who didn't prepare themselves for such a gargantuan body of text. Amy's trying to sabotage things, I explained. She let Harper's youth dies out of the gallery. Harper sighed. It might be time for me to... No, I didn't mean that, I firmly said. Harper's eyes were brimming with tears. I'm tired, Frank. I'm so fucking tired. I'm just one person. You're not alone, I said. I'll keep watch. She sniffled. And what happens when you reach your breaking point, eh? Maybe this is bigger than us. Maybe we need to tell someone. I scoffed. Who? The government? You think that would be a good idea? Give the exactor hundreds of minds to infiltrate. It's dangerous enough that your paintings are visible to the public. You and I won't live forever to fight the good fight, Harper pointed out. Yeah. Then we'll keep looking for people to take up the mantle. Or maybe we'll eventually figure out what that Incan artist did to truly seal the lid on these monstrosities, I said. He found a way to put them in the fucking bin for good. No watcher needed. Harper sighed. I guess there's one more thing you should know. What? I asked. The tooth, she said. It's in the house. Whoa, stop, I barked. What are you doing? The secret dies with you, remember? Yeah, but Amy's never going to stop looking for it, so you need to keep her away from the base, Harper began. Please, I cried. I don't know why you're telling me this. I just... I have a bad feeling. I looked up to find that the member of staff had left, and that was when the clamp tightened on my gut. The sun seemed to dim, and an emptiness filled the room. I know that sounds like a contradiction, but I'm sure Harper felt it too. Her eyes widened. Frank? Harper gulped. Is there a Red Range Roger in the car park? Legs trembling, I crept over to the canteen window and squinted. A graying cloud hovered heavily above. Blue sky lay beyond the solitary omen. There seemed to be no other visitors. Beside my white Mitsubishi, there was only a crimson Range Rover. I shrieked in horror. Frank, Harper began. You need to... A splintering sound echoed around the canteen, and I spun around to see something sickeningly sinister. Harper's neck had been snapped backwards, and her upside-down head hung over the back of her chair, much like those menacing exactors in the art gallery so many months ago. In the doorway of the canteen, there stood a figure too tall for the frame. I screamed, squinting my eyes, but it was Amy. She seemed to be a regular height, but I know what I saw for a fleeting second. I chased her out of the building, heart racing as I prepared to meet a similar fate, but the exactor spared me. It had other plans. Besides, Amy was nimble. I was no threat. She'd driven away before I could reach her. That was three hours ago. I know where she's going. The good news is that their family house is in Ireland, so it'll take some time for Amy to get there. The bad news is that it'll take some time for me to get there too. I'm currently waiting for a flight. Tomorrow the world might end. Cherish your loved ones. I'm I arrived in Ireland after a short flight, but I was too late. The dilapidated house harbored secrets. Though I was armed with Harper's knowledge, the brutish building still intimidated and mystified me. The terror stemmed from more than vines creeping up walls or the graffitied innards of the haunted house. It was the place's unearthly aura, lingering evil from the horrors that unfolded 20 years earlier. Why did Harper have to tell me where she'd hidden the tooth? 
My hypothesis is that the exactor wormed its way into her mind. Maybe it finally succeeded in tricking her. I blame myself. Harper was careful for so many years. She lowered her guard around me, lost herself for a second, and that was all the exactor needed. As soon as Harper exhausted her usefulness, she was slaughtered. I can still see her mangled neck draped over the rigid back of that plastic canteen chair. The basement was a lightless hovel that carried a damp smell. I illuminated the cobweb-ridden room with my phone, and something elicited a blood-curdling scream from my hoarse throat. Amy. She was on her knees, shivering in the center of the room. She didn't even shield her eyes from my light. She just stared into my face with a blank, teary expression. And I realized something horrifying. The exactor was gone. I couldn't see the darkness in her eyes anymore. And if the creature had no use for servants, that could only mean one dreadful thing. The end was nigh. A bottle of hydrochloric acid confirmed that. It lay beside a gaping hole in the floorboard's woodwork. Amy had destroyed Harper's tooth, the only thing giving our eyes the power to imprison those frightful entities in their painted cells. My... My family's dead, Amy sobbed. It was as if she'd been in a trance for years, and only at that moment, decades later, could she finally process the awfulness of what had befallen her loved ones. Don't worry, I said. Soon, everyone will be dead. The woman bawled, and I wanted to empathize, but I kept seeing her younger sister's neck, the very neck that Amy had viciously snapped several hours earlier. It was hard to trust her. How long has it been? I asked, pointing at the acid-formed hole in the floor. I destroyed it shortly before you arrived, within the hour perhaps. Amy absent-mindedly replied. I nodded. How long do you think we have before the world ends? She shrugged. When I freed them as a child, they... They took time slithering out of the slab. They began constructing legions of creatures from the very dust of our house. Harper must have been upstairs for a couple of hours. And the world didn't end. They occupied themselves with torturing my father and me. But I don't want to talk about that. I blocked that trauma so effectively from my mind that I didn't believe Harper's stories for years. Whatever, I sighed. Let's just savor Earth's final hours before hell opens. Listen, I've been reading my father's texts. Amy sniffed. The ones left in this ransacked house anyway. If we hurry, we could... Maybe... I think it's over, I coldly stated. Amy's eyes sharpened, and her bro fur wet as she locked her gaze onto mine. But it wasn't evil that I saw in her ease, not the exactor. No, it was Resolvi. The dying dregs of a desperate human's Resolvi. That's it? What about Kara? She asked. Are you just going to let everything end? Well, what can we do? As we speak, the horrors are crawling out of their paintings. It won't be long before they wreak havoc upon mankind. And we're not exactly artists, so I doubt we could whip up. I trailed off, possessed by an inspired idea. The covered paintings on the gallery's top floor. Exact copies of the ones downstairs, I whispered. Amy slowly nodded, gathering my drift. Right. Harper's backups. Backups for fuck-ups, she used to say. The name-etching ritual. Must it be performed by the original artist? I asked. Amy shrugged. The texts only dictate that the one who uses a sacrificial etching tool, their tooth, will bind the apocalyptic abhorrences to drawn likenesses. So if I were to etch my name into each of Harper's backup paintings, I thoughtfully whispered, delicately tapping one of my teeth. But then I sighed. We're miles from England. Thousands will have died by the time we reach the gallery. Amy's eyes widened. You know, there are other ancient rituals that our father detailed in his translated texts. Mayans, Incas, and other ancient cultures learned things that modern people have forgotten. When their cities fell to ruins, the survivors utilized centuries of spiritual teachings to encage the exactor and its legions in prisons. But they used the power of art for other things too. What ritual could save us, I asked. A painting of the gallery, she answered. A doorway to the real gallery. My blood froze. 
I immediately recalled my terrifying experience in prison, being trapped in a painting that I truly believed to be reality. Harper freed me from that hellish place with an exit doorway. I swore to myself that I would stay firmly grounded in the real world for the rest of my life, but Amy was suggesting I willingly step back into that existential hellishness. And how would I ever know that I've returned to the real world? I asked. This wouldn't be like any of the other paintings. It'd be a portal, not a prison. You can feel the difference between painted color and real color. Trust me, she said. Even when you were in prison, part of you always knew that something was wrong. Can you deny that? Amy was right. A painted lie could never convince a person forever. But how could I be sure? And then I considered the alternative option, the total extinction of humanity. But we're back at square one, I pointed out. We need a painting of the art gallery to serve as the portal. Do you know how to paint? Can you create a believable likeness of the art gallery on a canvas? I certainly can't. I think you underestimate just how many paintings my sister created in her youth, Amy said, smiling. She guided me out of the basement on shaky legs, continuing to explain things. We moved to England because Harper couldn't bear this place anymore. But we also moved because I had business contacts in your country. Anyway, I found the perfect little spot for my teenage sister's art gallery. Amy continued her story as we clambered up the creaky stairs. So what was the first thing my sister did when I showed her the property? She painted the new prison for her macabre paintings. She said it gives a place power to be included in the ritual. Of course, I didn't believe in her deluded ramblings back then. I'd convinced myself that none of the supernatural horrors really happened on the night of our father's breakdown. Anyway, Harper left the painting at this house, along with many others. She said she'd do a better one at some point. Do you think it's a good enough likeness of the art gallery to work as a teleporter? I asked. Amy gulped. I really hope so. I don't want you to become trapped in some non-existent painted realm. A half-human, half-paint splintered thing? No, thanks. Great pep talk, I said. Really makes me want to do this. <laughs> Amy opened the door to Harper's bedroom and matter-of-factly replied, Not like you have a choice, is it? Unless you want me to do it. I shook my head. Inside Harper's old bedroom, a stack of half-finished paintings lay on her dusty, neglected duvet. Amy and I sifted through the pile, eventually finding Harper's early attempt at creating prison. Obviously, before moving to England and turning the property into an art gallery, Harper's visions of grandeur were a teenage fantasy. Fortunately, her painted vision was not too far removed from what the art gallery became. I wanted to do something for her, Amy somberly explained, tearily cradling the painting. After Mum and Dad died, Harper wasn't the same. I thought a place for her art would help her heal as much as the paintings horrified me. I didn't want to talk about Harper. The horror was too fresh, too raw. How do we turn prison into a portal, I asked. Sacrifice, Amy quietly replied. It's always about sacrifice. So, another tooth? I asked. To bend the construct of space, Mayans bent the mind. That's what my dad wrote, Amy said, handing me a bottle of Jack Daniels. I laughed. You're fucking with me. I need to drink to save the world. To travel elsewhere, you have to loosen the connection to your present position in space and time, Amy replied with a deadpan expression. I guess harder drugs might work, but this is all I've got. A bottle of Jack. I planned on drinking myself to death after all. I slugged most of the liquid down my throat, ignoring the burning sensation and the desire to vomit. Touch the canvas, Amy instructed and repeat the following words after me. Try to pronounce each syllable clearly. I placed my hands on the painting. Miss Andrews began to speak in an ancient language, and I followed suit. After several minutes, the alcohol started to hit my system, and I had to concentrate incredibly hard. I didn't want to slur a single letter. The colors of the painting started to swirl, and then something horrifying happened. My flesh began to melt. I shrieked, truly believing that Amy Andrews had deceived me. I watched my skin liquefy, meshing with the canvas, and my jaw dropped in terror. It's working! Amy cried. Good luck, Frank. What about... 
You? I murmured, slipping into the canvas. Amy smiled tearily. Every ritual demands a sacrifice, Frank. The line between fiction and reality disintegrated. What remained of Harper's bedroom had transformed it into a swirling whirl of painted collars, but I saw Amy Andrews clearly. I saw that blue, painted tear, trickle down her peachy cheek. I saw the blade that she produced from her pocket. The colors started to mix, but I knew what she did. I tried to scream at the horrifying sight, but my face was composed of a melting, painted liquid. My limbs slowly warped out of shape, and I felt nothing. That absence of sensation was the true terror. My eyesight blurred as the vibrant kaleidoscope of colors seemed to bulge and spiral. The painted art gallery grew to fill the room, and my body became sloshy paint on its canvas. Then I fell onto the darkened floor of the real art gallery. Nobody had been watching the paintings for hours. Not that it mattered. After the destruction of Harper's tooth, eyes were powerless against the exactor and its legions. The ritual had been broken. Resolving to fix that, I pulled myself to my feet. The world hadn't ended. There was time, but the gallery's eerie silence horrified me. Not as much as the first thing I noticed, of course. Empty paintings. Every painting but Harper's youth dies had been abandoned by the monstrosities that I was supposed to guard. The girl sat in her painting with her faceless head in her hands. She was sobbing, and I felt like doing the same. Her painted form seemed even more terrifying in the wake of the real Harper's diabolical demise. She mumbled, slipping her head out of her hands and motioning for me to come closer. As I did, she leant out of her canvas. I placed my ear against her face, shuddering as it slipped beneath her flesh. They're destroying the upstairs paintings, she whispered. But they won't find the apocalypse. Before I could ask what she meant, her canvas flopped out of its frame and softly floated to the tiled floor. My jaw hung agape as I saw the hidden painting on the back of Harper's Youth Dies. It depicted everything, every terrible entity, every apocalyptic situation necessary to keep the demons lost in their false paradise. Clearly, that hidden painting had always been Harper's real plan B. A more efficient way of trapping the creatures, only one painting to watch, and only one name to etch. Heart throbbing against my chest, I plunged my hand into my mouth. Pinching a canine with my thumb and index finger, I took a deep breath. Closing my eyes, I tugged with all of my might. The pain was excruciating, but what made it worse was that I couldn't seem to free the slippery canine. I needed a tool to loosen, the ritualistic tool. I ran over to the reception desk and rummaged around in the drawer for a pair of scissors. Another deep inhale. Then I started to slam the blades into... Sorry, I can't. It's just... It's too horrible. I eventually dislodged the tooth. The blood gushed in a free-flowing waterfall. Hand trembling, I victoriously held the canine up to my eye and began to laugh deliriously. I was inebriated, and I'm sure that eased the pain, but it still hurt like fuck. Drunkenly stumbling towards the apocalypse, which lay on the ground, I finally saw the light at the end of the tunnel. And then the front door opened. Frank? Kara cried. Where the fuck did you go? I spun around, shakily outstretching an arm. Kara, gee, go home. My wife's eyes grew, and she screamed at me. Look out! A heavy hand constricted my throat. Not a human hand. I already knew what had seized me. The weighty wave of hopelessness and existential dread was unmistakable. As the hand hoisted me off the ground, the thing started to twist me around to face it. There, inches from my choking face, was the ghastly face of the exactor. Its wicked white eyes pierced mine, but that wasn't what filled me with horror. Its flesh wasn't sizzling under the weight of my gaze. No tooth, no imprisoning ritual, no power. And that ever-gaping, ever-slack mouth suddenly closed as if the creature were no longer furious. In its place, the creature offered a smile, the most dreadful smile conceivable, the one I'm sure Amy and Harper saw on their father's face, the grin of a thing that had finally found a way to end mankind. I wheezed, gasping for air as the shirtless creature, twice as tall as any human, choked me. 
I had never felt so utterly petrified. I eyeballed the face of boundless power. A thing older than time itself, perhaps. The edges of my vision started to blacken, but I had no tricks up my sleeve. My eyes could no longer imprison it. And then I heard screaming. The exactor dropped me, more concerned with the spectacle in the main reception area. I turned to face my wife, and I screeched. Harper's ghoul had seemingly fled its painting, the canvas which still lay on the floor displaying the apocalypse on the reverse side. And I could only watch in helpless horror as the faceless girl merged with Kara's body. The exactor unleashed its boat horn cry, and its minions inexplicably seeped through the cracks in the tiles, slinking their slender bodies into the room, morphing their flat forms into full-bodied limbs. I wondered where the cavalry had been hiding, and I suddenly saw why they were so animated. Kara's eyes rolled into the back of her head, and her body began to levitate. I screamed in horror, wondering why Harper had turned on me in my darkest hour. But then, something incredible happened. Oh, Kara said, eyes still rolling into the back of her head. Now I see. The exactors began to lurch towards my hovering wife, and I watched in bewilderment as she flicked them aside. The exactor crept across the floor towards her, crunching the meager bodies of its henchmen beneath its feet. Kara and Harper couldn't kill the things, but they weren't trying to kill them. They were trying to buy time for me. I crawled across the floor, breathlessly spluttering from the swollen neck that the exactor had given me. And when I reached the apocalypse, I opened the palm of my clenched hand to reveal my bloody canine. Writing tool in hand, I finally started to etch two crucial words. Frank Hull. Those choral screams sounded again. The symphony of dying people. But it wasn't real. It wasn't real. And that was a good thing. It meant the exactor was trying to get in my head. It meant the ritual had worked. I looked up to see a gaping mouth of fury on the ten-foot-tall ghoul's face. Its minions began to decompose, turning into blackened masses of paint, much as Harper had described. The creatures slipped into the apocalypse, imprisoned in a painting once more. The exactor held on to our world for dear life, screeching under the weight of my eyes upon it. His flesh was a blazing inferno and he released one final cry of agony before slipping into the painting of the apocalypse. I ran over to my wife, who was lying on the floor in a dazed state. I... I just wanted to see your place of work again, she croaked. I cried with laughter, relieved that my wife was okay. What the fuck happened back there? Kara coughed. I came to save you. No, I mean... Oh right, the demonic possession. Kara smiled. It was still me in there. Harper just showed me the way. Honestly, I thought you learnt your lesson the last time you strolled in here, I said. Kara smiled weakly. I had to save you. But the evening's shocks didn't end with the re-imprisonment of the exactor and the other demons. In the early morning hours of my shift, Amy Andrews walked through the door. I gasped, eyeing the bandaged stump that used to be her right arm. I'd misinterpreted the severity of the sacrifice she made, and I think that news saved my fractured mind. I couldn't handle any more death. Amy's family suffered enough. Amy suffered enough, locked out of her own mind for 20 years. I intend to keep her far away from the exactor so he never gets his claws into her again. <laughs> We've talked about the future of the art gallery, but there's only one painting that really matters anymore. There's only one that's still fully intact. The Apocalypse. And well, Harper's youth dies on the reverse side, but that's our little secret. Miss Andrews said I can keep the job and she's hired somebody else to watch the place during the day. Somebody we can trust. Somebody who understands the importance of the art gallery. Kara. I wasn't too happy about my wife being involved, but nobody can be shielded from the apocalypse. No risks can be taken. Too much is at stake. I'm a security guard who works the night shift at an art gallery, and I think I need a raise. <laughs>